Okay. I wanted to do a talk on the similarities between the philosophies of John Ronald Real Token, the writer of The Lord of the Rings, the creator of Middle Earth, and Bruce Lee, one of my favorite philosophical martial artists and spiritual professors, you would say. <clears throat> And they have many things in common, uh, such as the art of letting go, which is also the, the art of dying, emptying the cup. It's Stoicism. Marcus Aurelius, if you're familiar, he seems to be the, the go-to for the book on Stoicism, so as to say, though it's really his personal journal, I do believe. <clears throat> anyway, I'm going to read from one of Tolkien's books, three paragraphs from one of his books, and we're going to stop here and there on each paragraph and talk about the similarities between his writing and Bruce Lee's writing. I'm going to read his writing because y'all probably haven't heard any of this before, whereas Bruce Lee's, we'll go over it, my interpretations, not, you know, not what he verbatim said. You all know what he verbatim said, and most people know what Bruce Lee said and has been and has been saying until he passed away. Anyway, let's start by giving you just a little bit of background on the book I'm going to be reading from. It's called On Yalindale, and it is a the first book in a bigger book called The Cimmeralian. And The Cimmeralian is a book that Tolkien started around college, around the beginning of college, maybe his 20s, around the 20s, and he spent his entire lifetime working on it. This book is essentially the history of Middle-earth, although there is a series called The History of Middle-earth, which expands more on the Cimmeralian, but essentially Christopher Lee put all this together. He, he's the one who kind of wrapped up the production of the Cimmeralian and, and picked what little canons were going to be there because Tolkien constantly changed his mind about this and that, many times to try to make everything work because he was so detail oriented so at some point he christopher tolkien his son had to just put it together and finish it and, and say you know this is it so we're going to read from the first book of this cimmeralian called anulindale you might as well look at anulindale as genesis of the bible and the cimmeralian itself as just the bible to middle earth all right that's essentially what all this is now some background before of some of the some of the few pages that you would read before getting to these paragraphs, since they're so close to the beginning of the book, would be that the world of Middle-earth was created by a god who created a bunch of other gods called the Ainur. The main god is called Ilubatar, and he created the angels called the Ainur, and then he showed the Ainur different sections of a musical theme that they sung, and those sections, when combined, created the whole theme, which was Middle-earth. So they only have a piece of the music. They can only see their slice of middle earth they can't see the whole picture until it comes together and is created but their singing process doesn't create it it's just a foreshadowing of the world to come there's a character one of the ainur named melkor who is more of the tantric one he wants to make his own music he doesn't want to follow the theme so he makes brash music and it cl clashes with the other music and essentially this is represented later on when they start making the world of Middle Earth as the good gods raising a mountain and Melkor are like, nah, let's make that a hole instead. And they're like, all right, well, let's make seas. And Melkor's like, nah, let's spill those seas. And so basically whatever the good gods do, Melkor does the opposite. All right, that's enough. We'll read, get into the first chapter and then we'll have, a, I mean, the first paragraph that I want to read. And then we'll talk a little bit about the water. Here we go. But the Anur looked upon this habitation in the halls of Ea, which the elves called Arda, the earth. And looking upon light, they were joyful, and their eyes, seeing many colors, were filled with gladness. But because of the roaring of the sea, they felt a great unquiet, and they observed the winds and the air, and the matters whereof the middle earth was made, of iron and stone and silver and gold and many substances. But... Of all these, water they most greatly praised. And it is said by the Eldar that in water there lives yet the echo of the music of the Anur. 
And many of the children of Iluvatar hearken still, unsated to the voices of the sea, and yet not know for what they listen. All right, so this is basically <clears throat> Tolkien saying, no matter, uh, it doesn't really matter what you believe in, if you believe in God, if you believe in maybe more of a Buddhist thing like me, where it's not the Old Testament God, but Jesus, a Christ, a Buddha himself, trying to tell you about the real God, the light, the source of all, the, the pure goodness. That's what we're talking about here. Water represents the source of all, is what they're saying. They're saying, and no other substance on earth will you see the reflection of the creator of all things than in water. All right. Water is the best representation here on this realm, the earth, of its creator. All right. So there we have a little bit of Tolkien's appreciation of water. And we know Bruce Lee appreciated water. He said, be like water. Water can flow, crash, whip, drip. It's adaptable. It goes with the flow when it needs to, and it creates its own way when it needs to. And it can be anything it needs to be. It can be a human. It can be an animal. You know, it takes the shape of what it's in. So you put it into a bottle, it becomes a bottle. You put it into a cup, it becomes a cup. You put it into a bowl, it becomes a bowl. It doesn't matter. Whatever you put it in, water takes the shape, right? Water is adaptable. Water can change. Water can grow. There is another scientist, I forget his name, unfortunately, who takes microscopic pictures of water. And depending on the type of person that touched or interacted with the water, whether that person was negative or positive, the water would reflect that in its molecules, like how a snowflake is beautifully intricate. Well, the, those snowflakes is basically is, is frozen, frozen water molecules that got frozen that way. And since they come from high up, from the positive energy up there in the sky, they almost all look beautiful, right? But if you were to touch some water and freeze it and take the pictures, and you're a negative person, it would not look beautiful. If you're a positive person, it would look beautiful. Your blood works the same way. If they draw your blood when you're angry, your blood work is going to come back as a lot worse than if they just drew it a few hours later when you've calmed yourself and you've made yourself happy, then your blood would, would be drawn and it would be a lot healthier. And that is how fast vibration, your positive mindset, things you speak, you spell, you think, affect you. They do. Everything affects everything. It's just about controlling it, not letting outside sources program how you are supposed to be. All this stuff gets into you, inside you. But we don't go inside and mess with it. It just starts doing what it's going to do, and we become the result of that. But when we meditate, we go inside, we look at what's going on. We can control how it affects us and what we want to affect us, what we want to reject and what we want to keep. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> Next paragraph. Now to water had the Anu, which is the singular of Anur, so one god, whom we call Umo, that's the name of one of the gods, most turned his thought, and of all most deeply was he instructed by Iluvatar in music. So he had the best ability to sing and actually create something from his music. But of the airs and winds, Manway, most had pondered, who was the noblest of the Ainur. All right, Manwe is one is the second most powerful of the gods. Melkor being the most powerful, having the most range, being the most jack of all type. He has a knowledge of everything, which is probably he had the most power. That's probably why he corrupted first. And there was really he's the only of the gods who got corrupted of the main gods. The lesser gods, we don't going to get into that. That's not part of what we're comparing right now, but. This is all interesting. If you want to know more about the history on Yulindale, I actually do have a full reading done in the voice of Aku from Samurai Jack. Uh, it's a similar voice to um, Uncle Iroh from The Last Airbender because it's the same voice actor. Um, now, I just did one reading of it all in one go, so it's not the best quality, but it does get the job done, and it is entertaining. Now, <clears throat> back to this. Of the fabric of the earth, 
had Aeol thought. So we're moving on to a third god, one that thinks about the fabric of the earth. His name is Ale. I said Aeol, but it's Ale. I always pronounce him wrong, but I know how to actually pronounce him. To whom Iluvatar had given skin and knowledge scarce less than to Melkor. But the delight and pride of Ale was in the deed of making. So Ale, he's the crafting god, right? This, this is the most important line of this paragraph. We're going to read that one line again real quick. But the delight and pride of Aule was in the deed of making and in the thing made, and neither in possession nor in his own mastery. Wherefore he gives and hoards not and is free from care, passing ever on to some new work. This is the most important line that we'll be talking about today because this is pure stoicism right here. This is pure letting go. This is emptying the cup. This is the art of dying. The art of dying is change. The willingness to change. Let your old self go. Let the ego doesn't die, but it's not in control. You supersede the ego. You let it all go. And all this stuff dies and is reborn like a metamorphosis, like a I'm sorry, the word of the word evades me if that wasn't the right one one like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, right? It's change. That's the real key there. And the the way they're talking about letting go here is basically he's saying put all your effort, all your motivation, everything that you are, put it into the act, the activity, the craft. Whether you're creating something, you're a carpenter, or whether you're practicing a martial art or an art, it's the movement. Put it into the movement. Put it into the art. Put it into the craft and have nothing of it left over for the outcome. What does that mean, left over for the outcome? So when you have something left over for the outcome, you will always know because if you fail, you will get upset. And if you succeed, you will get happy. If those things happen when you fail or succeed, that means you hadn't put it all into the activity and you had some expectation left over for the outcome. And that is a good way to fail. I learned this lesson myself when I was doing my video on Bruce Lee's feats of strength, you know, doing the one finger push up, the dragon flag, the insane one inch punches with so much power, it's crazy and do all that stuff. The hardest thing I tried to do at the time was playing the ping pong with nunchucks. Oh, man, I went for years trying. I could maybe play wall ball with myself on the nunchucks three or four times, maybe five, six times in a row. I could hit it back and forth. But on an actual ping pong table, I could serve it pretty easily. But returning it was psh, good luck. One out of 20, maybe I could return, right? It's hard. It turns out that video was fake that Bruce Lee did. But I still put a lot of effort into it. So far as to do it blindfolded, like I would throw the ping pong balls up in the air blindfolded and let my body calculate how, how high up I threw it and then try to hit it on the way back down with the chuck. And I got pretty good at that. You have to let go. You have to let go and put everything into what you're doing because if you're, if you're so concerned about actually hitting it, you're not going to do it. You're going to miss it and get upset, miss it and get upset, miss it and get upset. And then when you do hit it, oh, you're going to get excited. And that's all going to throw you off. You can't have that. you got to put it all into it. And then, bam, once you finally figure it out, once you're there, it doesn't matter. You miss it. Oh, it doesn't matter. You just keep picking it up and going. You know, it's all those people who do those amazing trick shots, right, that try over and 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 over again. Eventually what happens is most people are just going to give up. They're going to give up because they care too much. Some people just push through that, that want to give up, they, that want to give up. They just push through it, and they kind of become numb to the point that they don't care about the outcome anymore because oh, they're just like, let's oh, just keep doing it, just keep doing it. And eventually, they're going to be there because they naturally don't care about the outcome anymore because they pushed through so much care and so much work already. And that's what happened to me with the nunchucks. And that's when I figured out that the secret is to put everything into the action and not care about the result, right? The result doesn't matter, especially when you're in a real fight. When you're in a real fight, that adrenaline kicks in. You got to be in it, man. You got to be in it. You can't be caring about 
anything that's going to happen result wise you just got to go give it your best then do and act all right let's read that line one more time see what we understand here all right but the delight and pride of Aule was in the deed of making and in the thing made, and neither in possession nor in his own mastery. Right? He's making art. He's making beautiful art. doesn't matter if he spends a day or a year making that art. He's like the guy on the beach making that art, and then the beach just washes it away as soon as he's done, right? Just lets it go. doesn't matter if it took a, a day or a year. Aule is just going to give that work to somebody else. He's just going to give it away free because he doesn't feel possession over it. He doesn't feel possession over his own ability to even make that art, right? And neither in possession nor in his own mastery. Wherefore, he gives and hoards not. So he doesn't even keep his art, right? He just, he's, he does, he's in the action is what matters to him. The act of creating the art is what matters, not the art itself. So the art is passed and is passed and is passed to others and he's he's a, he's a selfless person and he's one of the greatest artists there is because of how he is living in the presence of the art and not in the future of the art or the past of the art it's like um when you're working an eight-hour job right that you don't want to do well are you going to spend the entire eight hours suffering thinking about how you want to be doing something else, having your mind somewhere else and suffering what you're doing now? Or are you going to even be even worse about it and suffer stuff that you're not even doing yet? So you're going to work your first hour and the whole time you're thinking about the other seven hours that you're going to suffer next. So there you go. In the first hour, you've made yourself suffer eight hours for no reason. And then you get on to the second hour of the day and you're thinking about the six hours next that you'll be suffering. So on the second hour of your workday, you'll suffer seven hours. And on the sixth hour of your workday, your work day, I mean, the third hour, you'll suffer six. You see how it goes and it builds and you'll work one workday and suffer 40 hours in one day. And you'll do that for five days a week or more. And you'll just be suffering all the time because you're not being present. It's all about being present and having presence of mind. Presence is appreciation. Undivided attention is appreciation. The world today has divided our attention so much. When is the last time that you've sat down and had a meal with undivided attention where every bite you're focused on and you're eating properly, you're chewing your food properly, you drink water with every bite so that your digestive system is starting before it even goes into your stomach. And then you rub your stomach clockwise after you eat for a few minutes to help that metabolism energy kick in there. You're not going to have heartburn if you eat this way. I'm telling you, and this is the appreciation. That is why uh, thinking about deep breathing is the best thing that you can do to appreciate life because breath is power. Breath is your connection to life, and it is, thing, it is the thing that you will do the most, and it is the first thing that you will do when you're born, and it is the last thing that you will do when you die. And again, it is the thing that you will do the most in your life, and it is also the thing that you will probably pay attention to the least. Yet it is the most important thing to think about your breathing, because to think about your breathing, to appreciate your breathing, is to literally appreciate life. And when you appreciate what you have, you will get more. When you're not thinking about what you want more often than you're appreciating what you have, that's when you get more. That is how the world works. That is how vibration works, all right? And it's not about just sitting all the time and appreciating and thinking you're going to get more. There's a doing process to this, right? There has to be a doing process. But once you learn to appreciate things properly, you automatically start rewiring yourself to be a doer, and it just happens naturally. All right, I'm, I'm already 19 minutes into talking. I've only got like six more minutes of video I can talk over, so let's get to the third paragraph and see if we can run through everything I want to try to talk about here. All right, here's the third one. Now Iluvatar spake to Olmo and said, Seest thou not here in this little realm, in the deeps of time, and in the midst of the innumerable stars, how Melkor had made war upon thy province? He hath bethought him of bitter, cold, immoderate, and yet hath not destroyed the beauty of thy fountains nor thy clear pools. Behold the snow and the cunning work of frost. Behold the towers and mansions of the ice. 
Melchor hath devised heats and fire without restraint, and hath not dried up thy desire, nor utterly quelled the music of the sea. Behold, rather, the height and glory of the clouds, and the ever-changing mists and vapors, and listen to the fall of rain upon the earth, and in these clouds thou art drawn nearer to Manwe, thy friend, whom thou lovest. Then Omo answered, Truly water is become now fairer than my heart imagined. Neither had my secret thought conceived the snowflake, nor in all my music was contained the falling of the rain. The rain. All right, so there, that last little bit is essentially what I told you before. They only had a piece of the song. They couldn't see the whole world. And after all the turmoil with Melkor and the back and forth and trying to create the world with Melkor, basically Lubertar says, look, see, no matter what he tries to do to destroy your world, he only ends up making it more beautiful with y'all. Did y'all imagine that the waters would end up turning into vapors and rising to the sky and filling the clouds and coming back down as rain? No, you couldn't have imagined it because you didn't know I was going to make Melkor do all these things in order to create the world. Y'all only see sections, pieces of the whole picture, right? They can't see everything. Now, to go back to Stoicism, I do want to talk a little bit about we talk a lot about letting go i want to tell a story about frankenstein's monster and britzit durden a dungeons and dragons character who is a dark elf and dark elves are raised underground in an evil society Dritz one day decided or figured out slowly as he became a young man that he's not an evil person. He doesn't want to be evil, and he broke away from his society and escaped to the surface area where his people are seen as pure evil and are no, pretty much attacked and tried to kill, be killed on sight. Any good person will try to kill Dritz Stewart and on sight if they have you know, an adventurer mindset, if they're a powerful person to do it, because they just assume all drows are evil. And it doesn't matter how many good things Dritz Durden does to anybody or anyone, they always treat him poorly and evil. And he, he grits and bears it. He always turns the other cheek and continues throughout his entire life to do good despite being seen as evil. Now let's take somebody else who was in the, nearly the exact same beginning situation, Frankenstein's monster, and see what he chooses to do. Frankenstein's monster is created by Frankenstein in his laboratory when he's studying in college in London. I believe it's in London. And it's either while he's at the end of his college years or he's out of college and he's teaching now or something. I can't remember. It's, I read it when I was in high school. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. All right, but either way, he creates this monster in his big lab building and it scares him. So he rejects the monster and abandons it there. And the monster eventually finds its way to a farm I'm sure he was rejected by more people. He was, he's a good character starting off, okay? So he finally makes his way to this farm. He's watching these farmers. He sees how they live. He sees their struggles. He sees what they need. And he's constantly helping and assisting them for like six months or a year. I don't remember the time frame, but he spends a long time helping and assisting them secretly, right? They don't know it's him. And he does a lot of good for them. But six months later or a year later or two years later, I can't remember when it, when it is, he does reveal himself to them and they reject him. And he takes this rejection poorly and he doesn't turn the other cheek. He decides to, to become evil. I don't remember if he kills this family or not, but what the, the, this is where it kind of turns into the horror part of the book where he spends the rest of the book hunting down his creator Frankenstein and his family and torturing and killing them. All right, so even though him and Dritz were in the same situation where they were both trying to do good things and constantly being treated like evil, Dritz chose stoicism and, and turned the other cheek and remained good and, and lived his philosophies, his character, his morals, whereas Frankenstein couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. The thought that he was going to be, be treated by evil his entire life, he said, I might as well be evil. And he went and he murdered um, Frankenstein. All right. I'm pretty sure that's good. I, a little depressing way to end it, but really, this, is, this whole thing was about being present. And being present means appreciating and being in the work. 
and not being divided. That is how you hurt yourself. If you're, I'm in carpentry, I'm in gung fu and heavy weightlifting. And when you get complacent, that's when things go wrong. You got to respect what you're doing and to respect what you're doing, your attention has to be there undivided and present. I hope y'all have a pleasant day.